Um, so with that, uh, Andrew, I think. Great. Uh, we'll take your questions. If you could uh, give us uh, uh, who you are and, and what news organization you're with, uh, that would be helpful. <coughs> I'm Sabine Muscat with the Financial Times Deutschland um, here in Washington. Um, you mentioned trade briefly, and I would I would like to ask you to expand on that a little bit. The president has basically um, affirmed his commitment to, to trade in the Asia Pacific. He wants to use this trip as a way to show that he is committed and he's engaged. So with regard to first the TPT, but also um, his export promotion initiative, uh, how realistic is it that he can first convince the world and second maybe even um, bring the message back home that perhaps ratifying the outstanding trade agreements would be a good idea or how can he use this trip to um, be back on the stage? and trade issues. Thank you. Um, I should uh, first advertise for CSIS and mention that Gary Locke, we've invited Gary Locke, the Commerce Secretary, to give a speech, and he's going to be here Wednesday morning at 10, I think, um, at CSIS to talk about uh, the administration's Asia Pacific trade strategy. Um, the President, beginning with his trip to Asia for APEC in November, began talking about uh, trade. Um, I I particularly in Asia. <clears throat> um, and then in the State of the Union, he had a brief reference, one line saying, if we don't join these free trade agreements, we'll be left behind. Um, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that, the, for example, in the State of the Union, uh, after saying, if we don't join these free trade agreements, we'll be left behind, uh, what came next was a non sequitur. Um, and he didn't explain how he was going to get these free trade agreements to the Congress. He didn't ask the Congress to support them. Um, and um, I am uh, uh, quite certain that Kevin Rudd of Australia is going to privately, if not publicly, urge him to move on trade because for Australia, which depends on an open trans-Pacific marketplace, the American lack of movement on free trade right now is, is, uh, is, is deeply problematic. Um, we have, the, the administration has, uh, and the president has said he would like to um, uh, uh, get the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement Chorus uh, to the Congress this year, and he has said that he would um, uh, engage, is the word, engage in the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, negotiations. The problem is, um, there are several problems. One is, uh, uh, to do TPP, to actually participate, the administration has to get from the Congress Trade Promotion Authority. And to, um, uh, to, to do the uh, chorus, they have to get the Congress to pass the free trade agreement with Korea. And um, there's a real question about whether the, the president still controls uh, his caucus enough to do this um, uh, and where it will rank in priority compared to health care, climate change, education reform, and stimulus packages. And my guess would be, and I think probably the conventional wisdom in town is, not, the administration is not going to try to do much frankly, on the, on the legislative side before the midterm elections. Um, and people in Australia and in Asia will know that. Um, so, you know, how much time do we have before Asia starts creating preferential free trade agreements and we get left out? We probably have a few years. So the president can let the wheel spin politically for a year on this. But if by the end of his term we're not actively and, and credibly engaged in some of these free trade arrangements, uh, there will be things like Korea-EU free trade agreement, uh, ASEAN, India, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and increasingly, U.S. business will find that they're um, uh, dealing with um, disadvantaged uh, positions. And it will be particularly hard to promote exports the way the president wants to unless we're engaged. So right now it's a game of rhetoric. And what isn't happening is action on the ground in Washington. Um, the rhetoric's been late in coming, so that'll carry us for a little while, but sooner or later I think um, there's going to be a credibility problem. And again, it probably won't move till after the midterm, and then we'll see what happens. The, um, well, I, I would um, uh, I give the administration a little bit of credit. When they started out completely non-existent on trade, right, completely non-existent. The president went to APEC in November. You know, APEC countries make up 44 percent of global trade totally non-existent trade policy, right? Every leader he sat down with asked him, what's your policy on trade, you know? Um, and then, Major, you interviewed him um, in Seoul, and you pushed him really hard on the course FTA. I remember, I remember the interview. You, you had it out down before 
after the November election. So, um, um, and then they started changing. You saw in the State of the Union speech, he had this export promotion strategy. Um, so, you know, I give them credit for that, right? Having said that, this trip is not going to do anything to help him on trade. If anything, it's going to expose how vulnerable they are on trade policy because, as Mike said, um, um, they've talked about TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Indonesia is not part of the TPP, right? Um, to do any of this, the, the, the President has to request trade promotion authority from the Congress. He's not made that request yet, right? It hasn't even come up as far, far as I can tell. Um, and um, as many of you know, ASEAN represents, you know, in, not just Indonesia, but all of ASEAN represents the fourth largest overseas market for the United States. Um, and the U.S. invests three times as much in ASEAN than it does in China, right? So this is going to all show that there really is a lot of talk about trade, but there isn't um, um, a, a whole lot of substance. Um, but I think it's, you know, in, but again, I give them credit because he came out in year two and really has sort of put trade on the agenda uh, in a way that many of us uh, in year one were wondering where they were on trade. This was just a glaring hole while all these free trade agreements were being negotiated, right? The Koreans negotiated uh, the EU FTA, then the FTA with India, um, uh, just, le you know, just leaving the United States behind. Um, so again, I give them points on making the turn, but this trip is not going to help them on, on the trade front. Hi, I'm Julie Pace from the AP. Um, you mentioned tensions uh, in Australia on Afghanistan. Could you sort of lay out what the public sentiment in Australia is right now with their involvement in Afghanistan and if we can expect any changes in the coming years in their involvement there? Um, Australia's um, strategy uh, for both um, labor and liberal, for um, left of center and right of center governments, has been to um, support uh, the neoliberal order internationally, and that meant up until uh, basically de December 7, 1941, supporting Britain uh, primarily, and then after that, making sure that U.S. preeminence is sustained. And uh, as part of that strategy, Australia has gone in to almost every uh, fight the U.S. has been in with us, and they've gone in, um, as they put it down under, at the pointy end of the spear. They haven't waited to be asked. They've, they've stood up at the beginning, often in Iraq, in Afghanistan, some of the early forces, earliest forces to go in are Special Air Service, our, Aust our Australian F-18s. Um, uh, their whole army is smaller than the U.S. Marine Corps, but they're extremely capable and their philosophy is we'll go in early, we'll take high risk, we don't do the cleanup, you know, we, we don't have the numbers for that. So that's what they've done in Afghanistan and they have somewhere, I think, just south of a thousand uh, uh, boots on the ground, which is, which is pretty good. I don't, I don't think they're going to significantly uh, increase that. I don't think there's an expectation that they will. Um, the Australian public polling I've seen, I haven't seen it in the last month or so, but a few months ago it was very similar to the U.S. It was sort of evenly split uh, about Afghanistan. Um, but it's not the kind of thing where the Prime Minister has any major, where Rudd has any major problem. The Liberal, the opposition Liberal Party headed by John Howard was in at the beginning and they support him. And within the Labor Party, um, it, it, most of his caucus supports him as well. So he doesn't face the kind of pressures that, um, that some other um, allied governments in NATO do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kimura with Japan's Kyoto News. Dr. Green, you said his stop at Guam is just a refueling, but um, at least Japanese audience would try to look into some implication here since, you know, the Guam is a part of uh, <coughs> realignment program, and uh, this is the cause of tension between the Japan and the U.S. government today. You don't expect any um, significant speech by Mr. Obama, like calling for Japan to implement the original plan of realignment. I haven't seen, the White House hasn't briefed the details of the trip. I don't know if, maybe you know, Victor, if he has a speech planned in Guam. I guess, it, does he? I, my guess is that he's meeting with U.S. forces and their families. That's usually uh, the pattern uh, that one would expect, whether it's in, you know, a stop in Alaska or Wilson Air Force Base in Korea or Camp Steel, Bond Steel. 
Um, uh, so it's possible in that context he'll say something about the relocation. It's true. And that'll be big headlines in Japan. Um, Guam, uh, as you know, under the U.S.-Japan uh, realignment agreement, um, the U.S. Uh, agreed to move about 8,000 Marines from Okinawa to Guam, which would basically cut the size of the Marine Corps in Okinawa in half and reduce a lot of pressure on the Japanese uh, 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 citizens there. Um, the Marines agreed to do this, even though there was some concern in the Marine Corps about splitting the force operationally, because the strategic payoff was worth it, because they thought that would get them a, a durable, long-term, credible presence in Okinawa, and they wouldn't constantly be facing these pressures. Um, but the condition the Marines had, and the U.S. Congress, was that Japan would build this new base for the helicopters at Hedoko, this offshore base. and. Um, that is what, for Tenma, that Marine Corps Air Station for Tenma, is now what is at issue. I just came back from Japan, and um, it, it is just not at all clear whether the Hachiyama government is going to be able to implement um, that agreement and, um, and build the new base, uh, offshore base at Hinoko as promised. And if, if they can't, if the government can't do that, if, it, if it's unable or unwilling to do it, then the move to Guam could be in peril because... Um, that base was the condition for moving the Marines. Uh, if the Marines can't get that base, then operationally the cost is too big. It's not worth it. And the Congress will support them on that. So um, given the, the declining popularity of the Hachiyama government and public opinion of polls in Japan saying that he's mismanaging the U.S.-Japan alliance, whatever the president says about Guam will be uh, big news in Japan. At most... It, it, remember, he'll be speaking to families. He'll be speaking about you know uh, their 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 uh, their, their um, uh, service and sacrifice. At most, I can't see him going beyond what Secretary Clinton and others have said, which is we think that the plan is the best plan, and expect the Japanese government to uh, move forward with it. I, I don't think he'd make any news, um, but uh, but but I'm sure whatever he says, even if he moves his left arm a little bit, it'll be big big news uh, in Japan because Guam is so critical. Thanks. Uh, Margaret Talev with McClatchy. Um, so what the president has been doing on these foreign trips is in the most important country that he goes to, he'll always give a big speech, and we'll expect him to do that in Indonesia. Um, how do you think that might be different from the speech he gave in Cairo? And since Indonesia is such a, a big country, I don't know that much about their posture toward the war in Afghanistan and where they stand. Can you talk about um, engaging Muslim nations in in an Afghanistan fight, I had a final quick question about um, U.S.-Australia relations. Um, can you talk about to what degree there's tension over China in the U.S.-Australia policy? Thanks. Well, um, first on the deg degree of tension in U.S.-Australia relations, I mean, uh, you know, with John Howard, it was fairly clear, right? I mean, for John Howard, it was... We have a very good economic relationship with China, which is very different from your economic relationship with China. China. But strategically, we are on the same page. Right? Strategically, the United States and Australia are on the same page with regard to China. You know, Rudd came in, and there's, there was this view that he was a Sinologist and that he was going to therefore tack way uh, in the direction of China. And I don't, you know, I think that was sort of the initial assessment. I don't know if that's really the way he is. I mean. If any, anything, the more you know China, right, the more you see all the blemishes and the flaws, uh, as with any country. Um, and I think what we've seen constant is clearly the economic relationship with China continues to, um, to, 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 continues to grow. Uh, I think Rudd has certainly been much more active than his predecessor in terms of thinking about regional frameworks in Asia that, uh, that involve China um, as a very central part of it. And ideally, he'd like to see the United States as another central part of it. Um, um, but I think in the broader scheme of